Today we're in the book of Daniel chapter 2, and we'll have our last study from chapter 2. And so uh, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2 and stand with me, I'm going to read a couple of verses in the middle of the chapter and then uh, conclude with the rest of the chapter, beginning at th verse 34 of Daniel chapter 2. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together, became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now let's jump down to verse 42. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with the ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face prostrate before Daniel and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could not reveal this secret, since you could reveal the secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator of, over all the wise men of Babylon. So Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Lord, these are uh, ancient words, words of long ago. And for some, they read as nothing. And yet those who understand because of your Holy Spirit were given great insight and wisdom, and we pray that today would be no different. You are the teacher of us all. Your, your Holy Spirit is the one who instructs, instructs us and leads us into all truth. And so today we ask that you'll help us to understand what these words mean and how they apply in today's world. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This is a very in, uh, unique uh, study, even for me, I suppose, in that it's sort of a foundational study for what's coming. We're building in this book of Daniel, and there's a, it's a prophetic book, and there's certain things we need to understand. And as we have been studying this, we realize that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. It was a dream that actually scared him quite a bit. He, he didn't understand the dream, so he enlisted the help of a man, a young man by the name of Daniel, who just so happens to have been a prophet. And he asked Daniel to please make sense of the whole thing. Now at first, Nebuchadnezzar didn't know that Daniel was a prophet, in fact, Nebuchadnezzar was a bit of a skeptic. He was skeptical that any of his wise men, or magi as they became known, uh, had any ability at all of divine interpretation or divine insight. And technically he was probably right about that, because before Daniel came along, they were pretty much educated charlatans, tricksters, and they were a bit slick in, in the way that they could fool kings before Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's father, for instance. They weren't always as honest as they should have been. This was certainly a fact that Nebuchadnezzar was well aware of, and so he was a bit hesitant or apprehensive at best when it came to calling upon the Magi to help him out. But he was desperate. You might say that by this time, of course, he was left a bit 
hesitant, as I said, but also quite agnostic. He didn't believe in that supernatural realm that is on the other side. He believed in everything that was natural. And uh, so then along came Daniel. Daniel, who by means of divine revelation, supernatural prophecy, introduced Nebuchadnezzar to the true and the living God, the one that had eluded Nebuchadnezzar this whole time. This began an incredible journey of faith that actually changed the king's mind and ultimately would change the king's heart. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream. He dreamed a dream that he didn't remember, and he dreamed a dream that he couldn't even understand. And so Daniel was asked to step in to interpret the dream for him. But that was really all the information that the king was able to give to Daniel. And all that Daniel knew was that the king had a scary dream, and if he didn't interpret it, he would be killed. (laughs) Tough. No pressure, I suppose. The only way that these details of the dream could have been known by anyone was if God himself were to somehow supernaturally reveal the details of the dream to him, which is exactly what what God did. He revealed the dream details to Daniel and went the next step and explained what those details meant. Daniel, then, like any good prophet would do, simply passed along the information to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the prophetic dream revealed an impressive image of a man. This image of the man represented a succession of kingdoms that were to rule the known world up until the end of time. That was the interpretation of the image that Daniel saw. Now the head of gold, that this image had a head of gold, and the head of gold represented the kingdom of Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar specifically. And then this image had a chest and arms of silver, which represented the kingdom of the Medes and Persians, who were yet to come onto the scene when Nebuchadnezzar dreamed the dream. Then there was the belly and thighs of brass, which was to be the kingdom of Greece that was, that was to come. And the image also had legs that were made of iron, which represented the Roman Empire. Now, this dream by itself would have been interesting enough, except that history confirms that this is exactly how the chain of kingdoms went down And it's very well documented throughout history. So that then brings us to the last part of this great image in verse 33. The feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Now the question that we're left with is, what kingdom in history would best fit this piece of the puzzle? And the answer to that is, no kingdom that we know of fits this part of the puzzle, which tells us that this is probably a kingdom which is yet future. Some have offered good suggestions as to who this kingdom might become, or who this kingdom might be. But what has prophecy buffs curious is this specific mention of toes, which we can only assume there are ten of them on a normal human's foot, or the feet are ten toes. In verse 41, Daniel said, Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Thus, the image of the ten toes. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. So the question is, again, are these toes significant? And, of course, uh, should we assume that there are ten toes? Who do they represent? Who might they represent? Well, most scholars agree that these toes refer to a confederation of ten nations, which are going to join together to form a stronger union. Now, these uh, experts suggest that it's 
got to do with some future arrangement of what they call a revived Roman Empire as the, the presence of the iron mixed with the clay. The iron represents the Roman Empire. So since there's iron mixed with the clay, somehow this nation has got to have some form of Roman influence in it. And that's the idea. That's the, the conjecture by the experts. It curiously today might resemble something like what we know as the European Union. The European Union, which was founded in 1957. At that time, they called it the European Economic Community. In fact, when I moved to Europe in 1992, the economic community was still a prevalent uh, uh, organization. It was still there, still operating, until uh, about 1993 when... Uh, the European Union was formed, and then they sort of absorbed and merged with the European economic community. They became one. Now, at the time when they were formed, 1957, there were six member states, so six toes, if you will, if you want to look at it that way. Well, today, uh, there are 27 of them, <laughs> 28 if you still count England. England, of course, has recently dropped out. Now, that's a problem, of course, for prophecy experts because the European Union uh, currently represents a coalition of, of 27, 28 nations, which is far too many uh, to fulfill the prophetic details of Nebuchadnezzar's image, which, of course, we assume has ten toes, as any normal pair of human feet has ten toes. Therefore, the experts would prefer to see ten toes nations making up this union. But if the uh, Brexit vote has taught us anything, we have learned that the number of European nations is capable of changing at any time. Now, there are 50 European nations currently on the continent, and 28 of them, minus England, actually are part of the European Union. Many of them have already made application to join the European Union, which could bring the number up. But at the same time, in light of England's recent vote, a few member states are currently rethinking their, their present status in the European Union and may drop out. So the number is fluctuating. And so whether this fits the prophetic picture or not, not everyone is sure anymore. So instead of a European Union, some have suggested a global union, a union that divides the entire earth, the entire globe, into ten economic unions. And interestingly enough, I read a book years ago entitled En, en Route to Global Occupation. The author, Gary H. Kopp, perhaps you've heard of it, it was written in 1991. <laughs> it's a, a, a very interesting book. And uh, it floated, the author floats this idea of a global union as opposed to a European union being the, the Earth's new kingdom. Now the author, Gary Kaw, was formerly a high-ranking government official, a liaison for the European Economic community at the time. He claimed to have special inside information and that this global union was not just some crazy idea, but that it was already in the works back in 1991, although it was done secretly. Uh, it was a little bit at the time, a little bit too uh, conspiracy for me, uh, but at the time, in that day and age, the world was not ready for a global community back in 1991. I think you realize now that with all the talk that's going on today, the world is becoming more and more ready for global unification. Now, some of us kind of look at the administration in America right now and we're wondering what in the world are they doing we see some decisions they make, some moves that they make, and it puzzles us. But when you look at their, their decisions in light of this idea of global unification, 
it sort of makes more sense why governments are moving and thinking in the way that they're thinking. Because we have, or we are and have been, on a course toward global unification, and it, can't, it seems as if it can't be avoided. And if that's the case, we sort of might want to rethink things on how we position ourselves. If we knew that this was what God was doing, that he was, he was allowing for the whole world to come into this global unification, then what do we do as Americans? Resist it? Are we then resisting God? Something to think about when we start to realize this, if this is the way we are interpreting it, and this is in fact the truth, well then we sort of want this to happen because it's going to bring the end and an ultimate uh, kingdom of Christ. But the problem we have here is if we are to interpret the ten toes of clay in this way, there's a bit of a problem. Daniel says in verse 42, the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay. So the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. So speaking of the kingdom that is going to be uh, that's going to exist as a representation of these ten toes that are clay and iron, which means partly strong, partly fragile, well, the governments are going to reflect that, meaning they're going to be partly strong and partly fragile. But they're also, it also tells us the people that are represented by those governments are also going to be partly fragile, partly strong. The fundamental weakness that Nebuchadnezzar's dream or image presents to us is that all humanity is weak and that we humans are the problem with this world and not our governments. Yes, government has problems, but government is made up of people. And so we, the people, in a sense, are the real weakness of government, meaning that people are governing themselves. And that's where the problem comes in. If history teaches us anything, it teaches us that the problem with humanity is really humanity itself. And that's why it's a huge mistake when we, make, when we put our faith in human nature. In fact, it's a bit of a misplaced faith. Such misplaced faith is and always has been a major disaster and a major problem for us. Human nature is flawed terribly flawed, and it's flawed because human nature is made up of fallen people. We have fallen, a fallen nature, a, a broken nature, if you will, a nature that tends to sin. We are prone to sin, as the Scripture says. We're prone to it. And because of that, we can't really rightly govern ourselves in true righteousness because we're, we're so unrighteous in our ways. Nevertheless, we seem to always make that same mistake of putting our trust in humans or in human nature, which if you think about it in so many ways, it's so, so idolatrous and that we think to ourselves that we don't need God. That, that really was the part of the problem with King Nebuchadnezzar. The king of Babylon was a humanist, you might say, in that he viewed himself as the god over his kingdom and really the center of his world, which, of course, is the basic belief of, of secular humanism. One such secular humanist, Ludwig Feuerbach, was a humanist philosopher. In fact, he was one who had major influence in the development of the mind and opinions of Karl Marx. He said this, he said, the beginning and end of religion is man. Meaning that all religion starts with man, and in the end they're going to be left with man. That's all. There's nothing else. So it's not surprising that Karl Marx grew up to be an atheist. And he believed, Karl Marx did, that man is the highest being for man. In other words, there is no God. Man is the highest. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar was similar. He, he denied the existence of a supernatural being. He didn't recognize that supernatural realm, did not believe that any of his magi had insight into the deep things of God. 
while at the same time, he elevated the supremacy of man. Man is everything. An opinion which is at the heart of secular humanism, which is very prevalent today. In 1945, at one of the earliest conventions for secular humanists, one speaker by the name of Arthur Briggs said, quote, A humanist is one who believes in man as the center of the universe. End quote. Now, this guy must have thought he was back in Babylon with King Nebuchadnezzar. Because that's Nebuchadnezzar's philosophy there. Man is man's God, which is an opinion that we're going to see come to light even stronger in chapter 3. You'll see what King Nebuchadnezzar King Nebuchadnezzar does with this prophetic information he receives from chapter 2. But the great image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which is found here in chapter 2, along with the prophetic revelation by Daniel the prophet, is designed in such a way that should keep us on track of truth and help us to be able to see things more clearly. That's the, that's the purpose of prophecy, to help us to see things. To help us to realize that in, in contrast to fallen man and the flawed systems that we seem to embrace and put our confidence in, as this story continues, we see the image of a stone. A stone that comes out of the mountain, cut out of a mountain without hands, and it destroys all previous governments. All secular or every human government is taken out of the way. Which is, which is the truth in that it tells us that human government is not the solution. But the only solution for man and his fatal fallen condition has to come to us from outside of ourselves and outside of our world. The solution or the salvation of man has to be provided by God. When we put our trust in man, we'll always come to ruin, always. That's what verse 35 is, is sort of hinting at. The iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together. Meaning they're all the same. They're all just mixed together. And they became like chaff from the summer threshing floor. Nothing. They become like nothing. Chaff isn't even worth keeping. And the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. They, they're just so insignificant. And it doesn't really matter if a man's leadership or if a government is as good as gold or as strong as iron. It's still foolishness to put our trust in it. The Lord said to, Jer to Jeremiah the prophet in Jeremiah 17, Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. Yikes. Stunted shrubs. Not just, not just shrubs. Stunted shrubs. That means they're, they're really short shrubs. They didn't even grow to maturity. It says, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. So there's a great contrast that reminds us that the world is headed for trouble and our only, our only hope is to put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Jesus said it best in Matthew chapter 21 while he was quoting from King David in, 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 uh, um, in, in the Psalms. And he said, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, meaning the Lord made it happen. And it is marvelous in our eyes. And whoever falls on this stone, Jesus said, will be broken. But, how, uh, but on whomever it falls, whomever the stone falls, it's going to grind him to powder. Wow, that's a desperate warning from Jesus himself that we need to accept him right away or our future is not going to be very good. In John chapter 18, Jesus explains to us why the future is not going to be good. In verse 18 of, of John chapter 3, Jesus said, He who believes in me is not condemned, but he who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
See, Jesus already knew the condition of man, the fallen condition of man. Jesus came knowing that all men were condemned to eternal damnation. We are already damned. That was the problem with man. So Jesus came to save us from eternal damnation, not to send us to hell. We were already going there. He came to save us from that. And so rejecting Him or denying His existence is not a good idea at all. It will leave us with a very bad future. You'll notice also in Matthew 21, as Jesus referred to Himself as the stone, the stone which the builders rejected. When He was speaking to Peter in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus called Himself a rock. Remember first Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But then in response to Peter's statement of truth, Jesus said, Now I say to you that you are Petros, Peter, Petros, which is a small rock. And upon this Petra, which is a large stone, a large stone that might even be a side of a mountain, this cliff, in fact, where Jesus says this in Caesarea Philippi, we're going to be there in a few weeks when we're in Israel, we're going to stop and visit this place. I love this place because this is where Jesus said these words. You are Petros. And upon this Petra, the side of a mountain, a cliff mountain, gigantic place. And I could see Jesus holding a stone. He says, you are this stone. I am that mountain right there. That was the contrast. And upon that mountain, upon this truth, it's a mountain of truth, I'm going to build my church. You confess that I am the Christ. That is the foundation stone of the Christian faith, that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. He said, I will build my church there. Now here are these mentions of stone, the mentions of stone, the mention of rock. Doesn't that take you back to the image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream? In verse 34 of our text, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands and struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, which indicates the timing that these, this image will be struck. In the timing of that last nation or that last kingdom made of ten toes, the union of nations that is partly strong and partly weak. This stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. No doubt we can see this connection, the connection of these, these references to the stone. That Christ, the rock, Jesus is the stone. A stone that was cut without hands, meaning it was not formed, it was not contrived, it was not devised by human means, was not devised by men of any kind, wasn't even influenced by man in any way. Even, you remember, at the, the announcement of Jesus' birth, the angel Gabriel said to Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Of course, Mary was stunned by this announcement. And she thought, how could this possibly be? Since I've never known a man. I've never had a relationship with a man. And in verse 35 uh, we read, the angel answered her and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. A stone made without hands. Why, even his, he, he was even conceived without human involvement. And Gabriel said, he's going to be great that He's going to reign over the house of Jacob forever and His kingdom will never end. That's what Daniel said to King Nebuchadnezzar. The days of these last kings, in verse 44 of our text, 
the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And the kingdom will never be left or passed to other people. Meaning that Christ is going to reign forever. And it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. All human kingdoms. All human governments. All human rule will be no more. It shall be, and it shall stand forever. Christ's kingdom will. This will be the final kingdom on earth. Christ's kingdom. And Christ the rock will be the king. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 21, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief primary cornerstone. And whoever falls on this stone, the primary stone, Jesus Christ, whoever falls on Jesus will be broken. But on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. It's better, in other words, that we bow to Christ now and be broken than to reject Him and be crushed to powder later. There is a judgment. A judgment is coming. And the judgment is going to be leveled against those who do not believe. And so when He says that we need to come to this stone, fall on this stone and be broken, you have to think in your mind, what could He possibly mean? We're going to fall down and break ourselves? Now think of it more like a, a wild stallion a wild stallion, and that it's running free in the, in the wild, and, and it's, it's untamed, and it's good for nothing. Oh, it's beautiful, sure. It's free, it's wild, but useless. No purpose for it. In fact, it can be quite destructive in that way. There's an island uh, down south. You know that island where the horses run free? You, you try and have a picnic out there, and it, well, while the horses are running all over the island, they like to come and eat your food. It's, it's bad like getting attacked by bears, only they have, uh, they're prettier. But I don't know why I said that. <laughs> it makes no sense to me whatsoever. The point is, is that when we come to Christ, He makes us useful. When we come to Christ, we will lose certain things that we thought were valuable like our independence. We think independence is such a great thing, but Christ dependence or dependence on the Lord is better than having self-dependence. It's better. It's, it's, it's not idolatry when we put our faith in Christ. It is idolatry to put our faith in ourself. That's the idea. And so to reject Him we would be crushed to powder, but to receive him, we will be made useful. A lesson, of course, that Nebuchadnezzar is going to have to learn, and he would have to learn it the hard way. Man's pride and independence must be broken. And that's how chapter 2 ends. Chapter 2 of the book of Daniel ends with Nebuchadnezzar somewhat amazed and impressed by the God of Daniel. Let me just say that admiration or amazement for God is not enough. It was not enough to spare Nebuchadnezzar what was to come. As we get into chapter 3, you'll see that it, it begins with Nebuchadnezzar's defiance and rebellion. And God needed then to show him firsthand how God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Nebuchadnezzar, in the end of chapter 2, admits to Daniel, truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. But you know, that's a very good place for Nebuchadnezzar to begin his journey of faith. But you see, the devil also believes that stuff. It's a true statement, what Nebuchadnezzar says. But the devil also believes it. And so many people fall into that category where they'll believe certain things about God. They'll believe certain things about Jesus Christ. But they're not really climbing any mountains there. Because they can, they can say that they believe, but at the same time, they haven't broken a thing. They haven't fallen upon Christ to the point of usefulness. They haven't fallen upon Christ to the point to where they are truly, genuinely born again. 
to where they have truly surrendered themselves to Christ's leadership and government. They're still self-ruled, though they believe. But that's the exact condition that the devil is in. He believes, but he's not ruled by Christ at all. Very different situation. It reminds me a lot, Nebuchadnezzar does, of what God said in Isaiah 45, verse 23. God said, The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and it shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear an oath and allegiance to me. Paul, you remember, referred to that verse in Philippians 2, adding just a little more detail as he says in Philippians 2 and verse 9, God has highly exalted Jesus and given him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day, every human being on the face of the earth is going to assume the same exact position that Nebuchadnezzar did at the end of the chapter of chapter 2 when he falls on his face before Daniel. Only we'll be all, all of us on our face before Jesus Christ. Every knee, every, everyone will bow. But today, you see, we're faced with a decision. And the decision, I don't think, could be any clearer than what, what we've, we've seen here. And that is that we can believe and confess that Jesus is Lord and thus be saved. Or we can reject Jesus and be damned. The choice is ours. It's, it's not like we're going to curse God and say, you sent me to hell. No, 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 no. No, that will be instantly rejected. Nobody sends you to hell but you. If you hear this message, so that's part of the problem. If you hear, hear what I'm saying right now, you have no longer any excuse because I've just given you the truth of your future if you do not accept Jesus Christ. But I've also given you the solution. If you do accept Jesus Christ, and believe in Him as your Lord and Savior, then you don't have to go to hell. That's, that's really the gospel message. It's, that's why it's good news. Or if you prefer, I could say it the way Jesus said it. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls will grind him to powder. It's just exactly what Jesus is saying. But either way, each of us is faced with the same choice. I've already made my choice, and I'm sure that many of you have made a similar choice. But judging by the way things look today, we may very well be running out of time. I don't want to play the role of doomsday prophet. That's not my intention here. But, but the world looks like it's about to implode on itself. Have you ever done this? You should try this. If you haven't, I do this a lot. I, I, I read a lot of news sites. I go to different sites. I look at conservative sites. I look at liberal sites. I read them all, and I would like to see what people are thinking and saying in the world, and I try to inform myself as much as I possibly can on different views or different opinions. Uh, and, you know, just reading the headlines from around the world, I even read European papers as well. Sometimes I can read a German and sometimes I can read Italian papers too. And I read what's going on. I also go to the Jerusalem Post and I read them all. Do you know that our world is in real trouble? That's what the head, just the headlines alone tell you that. The headlines alone tells us we're in trouble. The world is a mess. I don't know if it's because we're just, you know, getting more information. And the news, the internet helps us to get news like never before, or if we're actually seeing chaos and calamity like never before. But it sure looks real bad to me. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said that in the last days you're going to hear of wars and threats of wars, but he, he said, don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation, he said, will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. 
There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this is only the first of the birth pains, with more to come. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. Many of you will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold and non-existent. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. In Luke 21, he adds a little more detail, saying, and then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with power and great glory. This, by the way, is the stone that is cut out of the mountain. Just said in a different way. Then he went on to say, when all these things begin to happen, it's time for you to stand and look up for your salvation is near. When these things begin to happen, well, I just read you a list. We're seeing a lot of those things now. I'm not saying it's happening, but it's beginning. So when you see these things happening, Jesus said, know that the kingdom of God is near, meaning that this marks the end of human government. My question then is, what shall we invest in? What should we be focusing our attention on? I had one fellow after the sermon first service, he said, do you mean I shouldn't finish painting my house? I said, no, you should paint your house. Leave it for the guy who's going to be living in it when you're gone. Jesus said, occupy or continue to live normally until he comes. That's what we do. We continue to live normally and we shine the light of Jesus Christ. But let me just leave you with this. Verse 45 of our text, Daniel told King Nebuchadnezzar, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. Notice this last sentence. The dream is certain. Its interpretation is sure. This is a double bubble fact. That's what he said. That's my interpretation. It's a double bubble fact. When I was a kid, we used to say, one, two, three, no changes. Tag my heels, American Eagle. I don't care what you say. You ever done that? You know, tag my heels, American Anyway, that's like, you can't, you can't trump that. Once, once you've said that, nobody can do better. That's tops. That's what Daniel is saying. This dream is certain, and its interpretation you can bank on. It's going to happen. Christ the rock is coming again. Get used to that fact. It's certain and it is sure. Nebuchadnezzar, he's saying, Daniel saying to him in a sense, don't ignore the warning. He's coming again. And those of you within earshot of what I just said, whether you're listening to it here in this room or you're listening to it on the internet or you're listening to it uh, through a CD or some other way, you just got word Christ the rock is coming again. And if you're not ready for that, it's your fault. That's basically what Nebuchadnezzar heard from Daniel. This prophecy is a warning. It's a warning to Nebuchadnezzar. But it's also a warning to all of us that the dream is certain. The interpretation is sure. Christ the rock is coming and He's coming very soon. And it's something we cannot ignore. The end is coming, and so the question is, what will you now do? I recommend a complete surrender to Jesus the King. I suggest that you fall upon the rock, Christ the rock, and be broken, because that's the only way to be fixed, is to fall upon Christ the rock. Let's pray together. Lord, this is something that we want to do willingly. We don't want to be forced to give our lives to you. But as our minds can track with this, we realize there's, there's, there's some good wisdom you're giving us. It's not just a warning. It's, it's wisdom. You're telling us what to do. Just simply surrender to fall upon the rock. Willingly come and give ourselves to Jesus Christ. 
so that we will be useful for you and for your kingdom. We will contribute to what it is that you're looking to accomplish in this world. You're going to make us a light and fill us with power of your, the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that is what we want. That is what we pray for. But there are some who still resist. Why? I'm sure they don't even know. We know because we used to resist. We know what it's like to reject Jesus Christ, to reject God's salvation. But then we also know what it's like when we say, yes, Lord, we will receive you. We believe in you. If you're here today and you're in that category, a little skeptical, but, but you know that you're not right. You know that something's wrong. You know that, that you're a sinner, that you need Jesus. And what are you waiting for? Turn your life over to the Lord. In your heart, surrender. In your heart, let God move in. If you want to pray a prayer of surrender, then you pray this prayer with me now. And simply say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I confess I'm a sinner. I need you to forgive me. Fill me with your, your love and your spirit. Help me to become useful. I willingly come and fall upon the rock now. Save me. Save me from certain destruction. That's what saved means. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.